remember who you are. Remember what you came here for. Let go of everything that is holding you back. And even when it seems helpless or hopeless, just focus on the next step. It's extremely simple. Keep it simple. It's always been simple. It will always be simple. God made everything in existence. Creator, whatever you want to call it, made everything in existence. And that everything has an order. And that order is extremely simple. And you can see it all around you. You can feel it all around you. And Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Otto Gomes Crypto Show. I'm your host, Otto Gomes. <sighs> I, I love this next guest. He just, every time I, I see him or am around his energy, it's as if I, I just took CBD or, <laughs> or just grounded down somehow just because of the energy that he carries. Um, and his name is Kai Jones, a.k.a. Pineal Purity. Kai is a visionary and guide with a passion for bringing spiritual frameworks into practical reality. His love for song, ceremony, and connection are a reminder of how potency grows through simplicity. After experiencing an NED near-death experience, his life trajectory took him towards one that most of us can only dream of. Today, Kai is a transformation guide with in the Sacred Sons verse, as well as beautifully written poems and written words that drop like bombs of light, shaking up the conscious landscape. Ladies and gentlemen, Kai Jones. <laughs> All right, I have a quick clip that I want to show of Kai in his beautiful voice. I think this is um, this requires its own little moment here. So here, here we go. Kai Kai Kai, in my alada. Kai Kai Kai, asesu alada. Kai Kai Kai, in my alada. Kai Kai Kai, asesu alada. Pare go go, para mi ti, pare go go, in my pare go go, para mi ti, pare go go, in my 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 All right, Kai, 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 my brother Kai, how are you today, my friend? Doing great. Just coming in from the jungles of Maui out here, feeling real, real good and really grounded and excited to share in the magic. Every time I've seen you, your energy is always resonating with my man. And yeah, I'm, I'm excited to kind of navigate these uh, threads between what is happening in the spiritual realms, if you will, and then also like grounded, tangible, physical reality and how those things can be bridged as well. That's, that's what I'm here for. And that's, that's what you're here for as well. So excited to, to connect brother. Yes. Yes. And you said it right. Being the bridge, being the bridge. I feel like we're in a time of our lives where if, if, if you're not at least becoming aware of what that means, um, you're going into a direction that has no choice. It's like, you're, you're just not going to, not going to have a choice in what that bridge looks like. So, um, thank you for being a bridge. And yes, we are here attempting to, you know, um, uh, bridge the gaps between the different paradigms. And there's many of them. There's many metaphysical layers to that paradigm. And Kai, you bring one that I don't see. I don't touch. I can't smell. I can't hear it, but I can feel it. I feel it in my body, the bridging. And so thank you. Thank you for being who you are and what you're doing. It's just making waves in this reality. So 
Tell me just a little bit about your journey, your hero's journey, as I like to call it, until this point. And what specifically was that red pill moment that really kind of shook you out of this reality? Yeah, I'll uh, I'll give you the spark notes because it's been it's been ten years in this uh, mm. in this game of of growth. And so for me, I was born in a very special way. I was born with a heart defect, and so I had open heart surgery when I was seven days old, and then a pulmonary valve replacement surgery when I was fifteen years old. And then about the time I was going into college was when I first experienced uh, mushroom medicine or uh, psychedelics for the first time. And that began to really open my lens of perception. And I began to remember different things that transpired when I was little. And as I, luckily at that time, I was talking to an elder in my family. She was in her seventies back then. And she was telling me about how, oh, our family is, is different. And I didn't, I didn't really understand what she was saying, but I was telling her everything that I was learning and realizing and experiencing in my meditations. And she's from the South and she goes to church and she, you know, has her own way of being with, with God and creator. And she began to share with me some of her really profound experiences that I could tell like she hadn't shared for years. And I began to realize like, oh, this is actually this way of being between the worlds or walking this thin line between the veil is very natural for my family. And mm -hmm. as I got to about the age of 23, uh, I had a complication with the scar tissue on my heart and that scar tissue was from the surgeries and so i had this experience where my heart rate accelerated exponentially it started out lower and then it got all the way up to 300 and i was able to stay like fully conscious and cognizant the whole time and just focused on my breathing but as i went through this experience my lower body my organs started to shut off uh, my vision started to get blurred and there became this moment where I was at the gym and I didn't really know what to do. And this voice inside of me said, just ask for help. And so I asked for help and they brought me out into the locker room. And from there, they called the paramedics and they hooked me up to this uh, EKG that also functions as a defibrillator as well. So that they don't actually have to switch out to panel to it just to, it automatically does it if it needs it right yeah yeah and so they looked at it and they saw my heart rate was already above 300 and they rushed me out to the hospital and when i got to the hospital it was like one of those scenes from like gray's anatomy where like all of a sudden they're like all on you and everybody's communicating and i'm in such a state where i'm just observing what's happening and from that point I knew they were waiting for something. I just wasn't exactly certain. And in that state, I could see, oh, this guy is the guy that's supposed to be saving my life right here. But he looks super nervous, <laughs> like super detached from the experience. I'm like, oh, like, like this is all happening and I'm participating in it, but I'm not attached to the outcome. I'm not attached to anything that's happening right now. And that guy looks very nervous. I'm curious why he's nervous. And we wait a little bit longer and they're prepping me for, to, to kind of shock me and reset me. And this guy runs in and he's out of breath. And he's like, oh my gosh, I came all the way from the other side of the hospital. What is it? And the other guy looks relieved. And it turns out that's the cardiologist for the hospital. And the ER doctor looks at the cardiologist and he goes, give that a listen you're never going to hear that again. And they both put their stethoscopes on my chest and the cardiologist, his mouth just like drops open and he's just like, and his eyes are like popping out of his head. And I just started laughing. Um, and they just, they were like, okay, give him more oxygen. Like we have to do this now. Cause he's, he's, uh, is it because your heart rate was like so high over 300 and, and yeah, pretty much what happens when you have an arrhythmia, it's, Usually an arrhythmia or a tachycardia is at a lower pulse rate. So mm -hmm. 
if it goes up over a certain rate, it means you're having a heart attack or it means you're having atrial fibrillation. But in my case, it was so high, they couldn't tell if it was tachycardia or atrial, atrial fibrillation. So, uh, so a common thing from people who've had surgery or from, or he's having a heart attack and they couldn't tell. So either way they needed to reset me and they hooked me up to this machine and it shocked me and it stopped my heart. And that was probably the most interesting experience. And this, I'm putting words to it, but even the words aren't necessarily accurate. This is most 100%, I get that. <laughs> of, of my current individualized existence where I'm no longer in my body and I, I look down and I don't see anything. And then I look up and there's this curiosity, this, hmm. And curiosity is what is before thought. So it's the inkling or inspiration to cultivate a perception of reality or of an experience. And so that curiosity was like, hmm. And in that space, there was no thoughts anymore. It was simply everything was one there. And I looked up and it was this feeling of, huh, I've, I've been here before. I know this, but I'm not necessarily familiar with it from an individualized lens. And as I began to wonder, what is this space through curiosity, the space started to pulsate and waves of, of light or energy or perceived light, right. Or energy yeah. began to pour over me. And I began to notice there was other presences in that space with me as well. And I just began to hear, I am that I am, that I am, that I am like over and over again in this like rhythmic tone, just like washing over me. And the only time I had ever heard that was in scripture class. When I was 15, I read that phrase in the Bible and I had this weird moment where it felt like I had already heard that before, oh. but it's because that space is outside of time. I got chills and goops when yeah. you said that. Yeah, yeah. That space is outside of time. So in reality, I, I had heard it before, but that per personalized, individualized aspect of myself in the past knew that space outside of time already. So when I heard those words, it was like, oh, I've heard this before. And then when I came back into, into my body, uh, it was like full on just DM. It felt like I had been on a, a DMT journey. Um, oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Out, outside. And I was just lit, lit up. And the doctors were, I was lit up for weeks. The doctors were curious, like what just happened? How did his heart rate get so high? How did he not pass out? How did he not die? And why is he, why is his energy like so different? Like anybody in his circumstances would be sad or despondent or fearful. And I was just in the hospital having uh, essential oils going and um, live streaming. This is right when Instagram received, uh, released the live stream. Oh, wow. So I was live streaming from the hospital and they didn't have any restrictions or like algorithmic sure. filters back then. So I was getting like a hundred people in my live streams and people were like, why are you in the hospital? And then I would tell them the story and they would, they would be like, Whoa, that's crazy. And, um, I actually had a nurse who became a client of mine who was watching my live stream on her lunch break at another hospital in orange County. And she was on her lunch break and she said, look, she showed the doctors and they're all eating lunch. And they're like, ask him who was doing his thing. And I was telling her who was doing my thing. And they're like, ask him this, like, like what really, you know, and like I would tell them like, cause I was familiar with all the data at that point of what had happened. Um, and so, yeah, it was one of the most pivotal experiences of, of my life. And from that point, it actually had an opposite effect, which was, mm -hmm. I really focused on what can I do with the time that I have here? because that space is always going to be there. It's infinite. It's outside time. It's endless. It's undying. And so if this moment embodied as a human being is fleeting, 
then what can I do here to really make it count? What can I experience here? And, and what light can I really leave in this reality so that others can find their way back home to this space that I was like blessed to kind of touch um, through, through meeting death. And, and that's been the pivot. And that's how I've encountered you in, in Sacred Sons is I'm coming from that space, but I'm really excited to, to connect with all of the beautiful people um, that I encounter and, and really learn their story and really learn what makes each of us different and how we can best support each other going forward. Ooh. So, so, wow. So what you're telling me is that you, you were born with the red pill and then, and then later in life, you got the gold pill, <laughs> like another yeah. whole nother level of awareness. Wow. Wow. I didn't know um, some of those details I, I had. I had remembered you telling me uh, this was like 2016 where that second event happened, where the heart rate went up a lot. Um, that was when I was about 23 years old and 29 now, so six years ago. Yeah. About 2017 end of 2017. Yeah. 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 I remember that now, um, you mentioned this, but we never, you never told me the details of the experience. Would you say that what was happening in that moment that you experienced that space of infinite infinity? <laughs> I don't even know how to say that. Um, that it was your ego and higher self kind of like, or, you know, the, the, the collective version of yourself battling with the ego and going like, is it time? Is it not time? Is it time? Is it not time? And almost like you, you listen more to, I guess your higher self. I don't know. Tell me what, what do you think was actually happening in that moment? For sure. Yeah. I, I thought it was really interesting because I didn't have, I know that that's something that typically happens with NDE you know, people that have near death experiences. Um, for me, it was almost as if the like ego had dissolved, like the individualized aspect of self had already dissolved. And then there wasn't necessarily like a higher self that was separate, right? Because once the ego dissolves, you are that thing, mm, right? Yeah, yeah. You are. So there was no, no separation at that point because it had dissolved. And then from that dissolution, it was like being able to experience other aspects, right. That were outside of me, other souls or beings, right. That were outside of me that had also reconnected with that space outside of time, which is God or source or whatever we want to call it. Um, and that's, that's sort of how it, it unfolded. There wasn't necessarily any friction because there wasn't any fear. There wasn't any holding on. There was like a, I wonder how this is going to go. Um, right. That's what you said when you said curiosity, yeah. right? The curiosity took a hold and was like, let's just, let's breathe into it. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's powerful. Um, so, you know, I have to kind of bring it back to current events now with, with your experience <laughs> there, but it, it, from, from my experience in this reality for, for people, for an individual to start to become aware of their themselves you either have to make a conscious choice, right? You become aware and then you, you consciously choose to change and then you start changing on the daily and eventually it becomes normalized and you, you, you inhabit, you inhibit a new behavior, a new habit. Um, or you have a, dr a traumatic event happen, right? Something big happened in your life that shakes you out of your reality and you have to kind of go, okay, what am I going to do with this? Well, how do I deal with this? Would you say that, that <laughs> these last two years, two, three years was a collective Con, uh, a, a collective traumatic event that's now shaking people out of their comfort zones. And w what do you think has been the direction that most have leaned towards? Has it been more uh, deeper into the fear or has more people become aware and woken up? Mm -hmm. What I personally perceive that's happened the last couple years, specifically with you know, what we've, what we've all collectively experienced. I, I think I, what I was seeing was the pinnacle of, of the war on consciousness mm. Mm. and the darkness really attempting to like complete that stranglehold on the light. And I, even though there's been a lot of things that have happened with uh, jabs and other things that have been very damaging to people, I, personally look at it as though the 
the darkness didn't wasn't able to fully get that stranglehold. Mm -hmm. And so now you have a lot of people that are being quote unquote red pilled as a result of watching the side effects, right? Because it was like, oh, trust the government. Oh, give your power over to others to make decisions for you like doctors. Oh, follow what your family is going to do. And then now we're seeing the side effects of those decisions, right? Of being coerced into those decisions. And it's still free will. It's still free will. It's always free will. So a lot of people around the world are experiencing that that trauma point and it's pushing it's they either took that you know jab and now are experiencing side effects or are going to experience side effects in other areas of their life right and i i think on a mass scale we're seeing now the light was able to withstand the darkness and we're going to see a slow turning of that knob back over towards real sovereign embodiment that's the main goal here. It's it's not necessarily the aim to to destroy government or to destroy Western patriarchal society or to undermine it. In reality, patriarchal society functions to a degree in harmony with nature, mm -hmm. right? Like the masculine. When we look at patriarchy, we're looking at masculinity, and masculinity functions on hierarchies. If we look at horses, for example, the step there's one key stallion and he is the leader amongst mm -hmm. that whole group of horses and there's maybe another you know male horse there but he knows he's within a hierarchy and then all of the females are under the protection of that stallion as well and under the leadership of that stallion as well and so when we look at society western society we're looking at the patriarchal structure and it's been distorted because government has taken control of the natural order of things mm -hmm. and positioned itself at top at the top and then made everyone subservient below that and what we're going to now see is a return to sovereignty and that's what we've experienced through men's work with sacred sons um, through our own growth journeys it's through even expansion into decentralized finance mm -hmm. we're seeing a return to sovereignty and that's, that's the key component. And so for me personally, my message to everybody would be, yeah, that might've been traumatic and you may feel those things, but be able to feel what's there without allowing it to override your rationality and your ability to critically think. And that's the most important thing. People will say, I'm sovereign, I'm free. Like I can't be controlled. But if you don't have the capacity to critically think without allowing fear to cloud judgment or emotions to cloud judgment, then you are not free. And that's, that's what we're training to do is come into contact with the pieces of ourselves that limit us from truly embodying that adaptive potential of what it means to be human. A lot of, a lot of people are looking for like superpowers or saviors or, mm -hmm. you know, this, this spiritual guide's going to help me, or this shaman has this, this power to heal this. And um, in reality, what is humanity's greatest superpower? It's not necessarily like telekinesis or um, clairsentience or clairaudience or all of these other psychic abilities. It's always been adaptation. It's always mm -hmm. been adaptation. So even though what happened was challenging and is still challenging to a degree, our capacity to adapt as human beings is the thing that has kept us alive as a species for thousands of years. And if we continue to lean into our ability to adapt, which is supported by critical thinking, then we will be fine and we will grow and we will expand and we will use cryptocurrencies in a good way. We will use our ability to make good conscious decisions in in a harmonious way with nature um and that's that's really what we're here to do even though it may appear as though we're up against a very big specter it it holds no bearing when when we're able to actually tap into that unlimited creative potential i love this love this conversation and the direction you're taking it um you mentioned which i agree you mentioned that um the, the you know the the the, the feminine masculine traits, there's been, in my opinion now, sort of an imbalance. Uh, there's been a uh, glamorization for women to be more masculine 
and I almost say glamorization for men to be more feminine. So with everything that's happening now, you've ever, you've heard of, you probably heard of the term toxic masculinity and, um, you know, being said in mainstream media, what is toxic masculinity exactly to you? And, uh, why does it exist? So my perception of, of this matter is let's, let's hone in on toxicity in general, right? Independent mm -hmm. genders. And when it comes to being human, we all experience toxicity. And so toxicity is being out of harmony with your natural state of being. So it's when we harbor misalignments in ourselves, whether that's our diet, our lack of exercise, our lack of focus and concentration, our imbalances in our emotions, and our disconnection from spirit. Mm -hmm. And so if we are looking at toxic masculinity, now we take we look at masculinity in general, it's been out of alignment because the hierarchy has been superseded. So mm. when we look at the hierarchy in society, it's not a meritocracy anymore, right? A meritocracy functions on the best and most virtuous and most aligned are the ones that will lead us. Mm -hmm. And what it's become is the most rich, the most connected, the most, um, subservient to darkness will lead us. Mm -hmm. And so with toxic masculinity, these traits that like for my, for example, like my father, very successful, very strong leader has managed thousands of people all over the world in his career. And I used to think like, oh, he's a toxic individual because mm -hmm. he's aggressive, because he's assertive, because he's dominant, right? But if we look at the stallion, that leads the entire pack of horses. That stallion is aggressive. That stallion is a good leader and that stallion is dominant. And I think there's where masculinity becomes toxic is when the leader stops listening to those around him. When the leader stops caring for those around him and only cares about how he can benefit from those around him without contributing to those around him. And so I don't see anger. I don't see aggression. I don't see dominance as out of alignment because those are naturally masculine traits that we see all around us in nature and what mainstream media has done has made these traits off limits and programmed a lot of a lot of us men and women to think let's let's abandon these traits but when you abandon those traits the pack is now open to attack. Mm -hmm. So now it's a lot easier to steer the, the herd towards specific things because those leaders, what makes these people leaders is their capacity for independent thought, their capacity to remember past experiences and make better future decisions. So if you remove those traits, then you remove leaders from the pack and then the whole pack becomes subservient to, to outside forces. And so that's the uh, agenda that's kind of been at play is we live in a time where there are no rights that men have that women don't have mm -hmm. on paper, right? And there's always going to be gender-based double standards, mm -hmm. right? Like there are certain things that quote unquote are socially acceptable for a man to do that women can't. And then there's some things vice versa as well. And there are many, many double standards that, that benefit women. Many, many, like we could list them. Like, no, uh, dude, I love this conversation because it's so yeah. anti-political, uh, because that's, I agree. Men are, there are many, many things that men are way better than at, than women. And there are many, many things that women uh, can do that I can't do. So yeah, it's this weird, confusing reality right now where, where you have, yeah, sorry, finish your thought. Yes. No, like you're, you're on point. And to finish that thought, right. This is the question I'll ask. Cause I've, I've talked to women about this. Like, I'm not like gonna just like say in an echo chamber of men, like yeah, I yeah. like having these conversations. I like feeling friction. Um, yeah, yeah. And They'll tell me like, yeah, like women can lead too. women can't, you know, I'm like, totally. Yeah. Um, and like, let's say hypothetically, like you were dating me, 
Like, would you like that I take the lead and I plan what we're going to do? And you can like sit back, relax. And like, you're surprised when we show up at the, this place that you've been talking about. And like, you didn't know like that we were going there. And I, you know, made sure everything was lined up so that you like, you can be surprised and you can be open and you can be receptive in your feminine. And she's like, yeah, that sounds great. And I'm like, okay, cool. So you're totally capable of doing those things. But what's optimal is that I do a lot of that, right? So it becomes capable versus optimal, mm. right? It's like a woman could, can fight, a woman can protect, a woman can work really hard and earn money, right? But what's optimal, like, is me being able to do those things and her being able to be in her feminine if that's really what suits her. And the large majority of women derive their happiness from being like in their feminine, from being around a community and having a family. And a lot of men derive their happiness from being able to provide that lifestyle and then also to create their way in the world. And so it becomes about what can, what is, what can make me happiest and then what's capable and then what's optimal. And then that whole narrative around toxicity starts to dissolve. Sure. Yeah. Because it becomes about natural order. Right. I, uh, I want to go deeper into this. Okay. Um, let's say two people come together. They were not aware of where they were on their uh, spectrum of, of uh, uh, masculine to feminine. And so in, in my experience, people attract, uh, you know, the opposites will attract. Uh, if, if, they, if you have a very masculine woman, you'll probably that she'll probably align with a, with a more feminine man and vice versa, right? One attracts the other. Is it possible once they've come together and they start that relationship and they start working on themselves or start going towards healing and they become aware of where they're at on the spectrum of masculine to feminine and they start working on bringing more balance? What is necessary and, or is it even possible to bring balance to that relationship um, mm -hmm. so that you can both, you know, because what happens is if, if the man starts to become more masculine and the feminine and the woman is still in the, her masculine, the man's going to be like, ah, this is not feeling good anymore, <laughs> mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, or and vice versa also mm -hmm. for the woman. So, so yeah, your thoughts. So with men, it's incredibly important that they accept like the burden of performance, right? So mm. it's my job to like, be capable and do and excel at being a leader, right? Because now even say I get into a relationship, right? And I'm more in my feminine in that relationship. If I'm like, okay, I know I have to step up and I know I have to lead, right? Then what I'm going to do is structure it so that when I'm having some downtime, I'm going to be around other men that are naturally like masculine leaders. So I think mm. the easiest thing for men to do, right? If they're in a relationship where there's um, a flipping of the dynamic is put yourself around men that are naturally in the dynamic that you would like to be in. So then that now, now you're acquiescing to your own internal masculine tapping into your primal nature. So that's like one half of the equation, which brings that online for you. So that's a lot of what we do in sacred sons is that's bringing that online now. When we go back to the relationship, this is where it's about stepping up in, in being that leader, right? So one way to invite her into that surrender is the example I just gave, which is like, Hey, like I'm going to like Friday night, wear this, I'm taking you out and you don't tell her what's happening. You wear say, this. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Because here's the thing, like she's attracted to you. So she's going to like, she is turned on by the fact that you're now saying like, oh, like he's telling me exactly what to wear that's going to like make him most attracted to me. So now I can't, I don't even have to think about what I'm gonna wear. I don't even have to think about like where I'm going or anything. I just get to be excited for Friday night. That's and cool. then yeah. you know her really well. So then you're putting it together, right? And so I think the easiest way to, tr to transition that dynamic is for him to be in his masculine but bring in these experiences, right? That allow her to like safely surrender and for her to feel really good about surrendering into that feminine, mm. right? So create experiences that make her feel like, oh, surrendering into my feminine makes me feel absolutely beautiful and amazing 
and it makes me love him more and it makes me know myself more right and from there now in your day-to-day life you can bring that energy in because you're you're creating experiences for her every couple weeks every month where you're leading and then now she begins to trust your leadership and then she naturally over time begins to relax and so that's the key is like yes women have adopted certain masculine traits from external like mainstream programming Mm. but the way to shift it isn't for i mean and this is my perception isn't for us to necessarily tell them like you need to be more like this da 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 because they don't feel safe Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. safety is the number one thing Mm -hmm. so how can she relax and let her guard down if she doesn't feel safe and so it's on me to tap into my own masculine primal um, aggressive, dominant, um, capable energy and competent energy, and then bring that to our relationship. And then she naturally comes into that, which now puts me in the leadership position. But it also means I have to care for the person I'm leading. I have to listen. Like, even when maybe like my capacity is a little stretched, I have to be that pillar of presence that's necessary. And when there's something that comes up, this is another key code for for men that are watching that is incredibly powerful if you're already doing these things one thing that increases the polarity in a relationship increases the masculine feminine balance is if i have something i'm really going through that is not pertinent to my relationship Mm -hmm. then i'll call my brothers like i'll i'll cry with my brothers i'll feel through it with my brothers but i won't necessarily bring that same level of rely like i won't necessarily rely on her to hold my emotions because i can rely on these other men to hold it and these other men have the life experience to support me so like these other men know oh i remember when i was going through that like but she hasn't necessarily been in that same position as as a man so what she's going to do is hold space for the emotion you're going to maybe cry or feel whatever you feel and she's going to say it's okay feel better and it's going to it's going to help resolve the emotional state but as men we we require the next step the direction that we want to head so that we can get out of this this space that we're in um and into a better space and into greater harmony and so what i've found is most harmonious is i'll handle that stuff with my brothers and then once i'm not in a charged emotional state i'll let her know cuz most of this is for things that aren't involved in the relationship i'll let her know hey um, just want to let you know, like, I've been kind of going through this this week. Um, and I talked to, uh, my boy Marco and he really helped me out. And this is what I'm kind of working on. This is where I'm going to go. And this is what I'm going to do. So now she feels even safer because it's not her responsibility to hold my emotions. It's now I'm informing her of like, this is where I'm at. I'm still being honest. I'm still letting her know me fully. And then I'm saying, this is what I'm going to do, which now increases safety even more Mm -hmm. because she's able to see, even when he's stormy, he can still hold himself and he has others that will hold him, which makes me even more safe and then increases the polarity even further. And so that's, that's one great technique is like, do the men's work, do the self work, bring those really good experiences into your relationship to increase polarity and increase trust so that she trusts you guiding her and leading. And then rely on your brothers, rely on the men, rely on your father, if you have that good connection, to hold space for your emotions and and receive their guidance and their wisdom. And then let her know, hey, this is what I'm going through. Just wanted to let you know, this is what I'm doing about it. And because I love you, like, I'm just sharing, you know, and she's able to, to be like, thank you. I appreciate that. Or maybe she's like, been seeing it for a while and she couldn't put her because she women are feeling right. so maybe she's been feeling it for a while and she couldn't put her finger on it and then she knows like oh you pinpointed it and you're resolving it which now increases that safety and so that's that's how we get back in right relation with the natural harmony which the universe is does have gender you know and that's a big part of yeah, recent. one of um, I'll share a little bit from my from my own relationship. Uh, the biggest feeling safe thing that I or the, the the thing that makes her feel the most safe is when I recognize 
that I was that I did something that was um, you know wrong or or destructive or when I own when I take ownership when I yell when I take ownership she it was the response is always wow that makes me feel so much more attracted to you because you're owning it because you're 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 um, you know accepting that that was part of the reality and, and it doesn't feel like uh, um, how do you say that when you um, Oh, what do you call that when you, when you, uh, uh gaslight, gaslighting, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't feel like gaslighting. Um, no, I, I love this. I love this. You know, I, I think you said something here that really resonated and connected some dots for me from sacred sons and sacred sons. I had always heard the term, you know, we got to be the container. We got to be the container. So the woman can come in and fully express herself inside the container. And it makes sense when you say it, but in practice, I noticed my younger self coming up and being like, well, what about me? <laughs> you know, like, like I'm expressing myself. Why can't you hold space for me? Damn it. So what you, you're, what you're saying here and you said it, you said burden of performance, men need to carry the burden of performance. So are you saying that, the, that it, 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 cause one of my, my, my next question was going to be, do we need more good men or do we need more good women? So are you saying we need more good men to be aware of their own, limitations in their own place where they're at in the relationship to that, that trait and make space for the women. Is that, is that kind of what you're saying? I think there's a little more, there's obviously some nuance to it, mm -hmm. but I think the mission is to bring out the goodness in every man. And as that goodness comes online, that kindness, that will to, to do whatever's necessary comes online then the feminine naturally meets that masculine energy and harmonizes with it. Those women will meet those men and be like, oh, like this is someone I'm safe with. This is someone who's got me. Um, this is someone who I could have kids with. And so it's not necessarily a lack of either. It's actually like us inviting men to bring their goodness out, to bring their heart out and allow it to f inform their actions. And not like there's what a lot of men are, are kind of in right now is okay i'm in my mind and i gotta just be in my heart and then they're like all in their heart and they're making decisions that are ne not necessarily rational right and so they're like creating certain things out of emotion that aren't necessarily um, adding to their level of competency and so the key is us coming into contact with our emotions witnessing our emotions and integrating our emotions so that they inform rational decision making but don't override rational decision making mm. and as it becomes informed that goodness comes online because that heart is is desiring to to serve others and so once it's informing our decisions the right women are naturally drawn in right right and 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 because it's like now emotion isn't overriding decisions then the men will be able to see which women are actually align with them because a lot of women will be drawn to good men, but a lot of women haven't necessarily done the deeper, deeper work and they'll be able to discern which, which women are in alignment for them. And then obviously if a woman's done that really deep work for herself, she's already going to know like, Oh yeah, like yeah, he's, he's got it. Like I want to, I want to, I want to talk to him. I'm attracted to him. Um, so for women, it's more of a feeling like it's naturally going to be there. And for men, it's like being decisive and it's not about like, like us thinking rational thoughts isn't, isn't ego. It, it's about mm. allowing the heart to inform the mind and the ego isn't mind. The ego is the aspect of self that wants to survive. And so if the aspect of self that wants to survive is saying, Hey, like be aware versus like, it's saying, Hey, be closed off. It's like my, my ego is telling me, Hey, be aware, like yeah. watch what's going to happen. And so, because there's a relationship with that aspect of myself now, where it's like, yes, I understand. I, I got my heart broken. That sucked. Um, but I'm just going to be really aware. I'm going to hear what you're saying, but I'm still going to make that decision from here with a clear mind and not allow fear to override me. And so that's, that's that next step. 
Yeah, I would say, I would argue, not argue, but I would say that um, it's sort of like the horse before the carriage situation where the person gets the, they're not aware of their emotional reactions. So the emotion comes up and then they, they the brain comes in, tries to, tries to justify or tries to make the person feel safe or secure or, you know, it goes into survival mode. Uh, and then you have this disconnect because then they, they start to create actions based on the justification instead of the emotion because they're not in tune with it because they don't, they're not aware of it. Wow. Yeah, this is great. Um, you know, they, they say that uh, in mainstream, at least in the mainstream narrative, it's uh, people want sex, money, and drugs, right? <laughs> it's all about sex, money, and drugs. And so we talked here about toxic masculinity. I want to talk a little bit about money, especially with men. Um, this is where I, where I like to discuss things uh, is in re relationship to that energy that is money. What would you say is, if you had to put a um, percentage to it, what would you say is the percentage of, of effect that money has on how the man sees themselves in the relationship with the woman because money equals power, right? And so mm -hmm. like, what, what, what's your perspective on that? Um, money does play a pretty big deal because, right, money is directly correlating to how much value I'm adding in the world. Mm. Right. And so how much value I'm adding in the world is also going to kind of point to how happy I am. Right. Because a lot of men are focused on what can I create? Like the majority of inventions across time are all created by men, mm -hmm. not because men oppress women, but because men understood that their value is derived from what they can create. So if I know like what I can create is going to make me happy, and then money is a way to kind of measure, right, how valuable the thing that I'm creating or how effective the thing I'm creating is. Mm -hmm. So a lot of men look at money like, oh, I got to get money to survive. But money is a direct correlant to how much value you're adding that's tied into your purpose. And so money isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's, it's more so what are the deeper threads that are connected to money? And it's always going to come down to purpose and it's always going to come down to how much value am I adding and how much can I contribute to others? And you've heard a million entrepreneurs say this on a million podcasts. They didn't focus on money. They focus on their passion. Um, and that's like the, the details of how it's, it's tied in. Mm -hmm. So money, sex, drugs, um, well, I, I guess I, I guess I said that specific phrase because it, you know it's 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 the the three areas that mainstream narratives you know hit when they're trying to advertise, market, or do anything in this reality really that they're trying to indoctrinate or push or or get get sold or get bought. Um, so yeah, I mean I, I appreciate that response because I, I would agree. There's a, a, a very tight correlation between the the especially men men's relationship to money and then their relationship to the feminine uh because of of exactly that um that's a great response what well, what would you say have you have you looked into blockchain have you looked into crypto uh yeah i i own a, a good amount right now <laughs> you own a good amount of crypto yes. um would you say that that crypto is going to um, accelerate the need to, to, to be in tune with that relationship to money because crypto, you know, um, up until now it's been external custody or like custody in a bank or a centralized custody where now crypto is about self custody. It's about being, you being in control of that energy of that, of the wealth. So would mm -hmm. you say that it's now more than ever important to become aware of your relationship to money? At really, your relationship to relationships, right? Your, your relations to things in this reality, because we are getting so more connected to that energy and that wealth. I think crypto coming in and, and taking the middleman out of that relationship is really amazing. And when we look at the individual, it's really about understanding the balance between authority and responsibility. So mm. crypto increases our authority right? Because now I'm holding my value. And so when we look at like the misalignments, like people have made hundreds of millions of dollars on crypto, but then they have a lot more authority, but lack the responsibility piece because mm -hmm. they're out of touch with themselves. 
And so that's the key thing, right, is authority versus responsibility. And, and as we kind of grow, the most important thing that we're cultivating is responsibility. We begin to see like, oh, this relationship matters. I have a responsibility to protect it and cultivate it. Oh, my family matters. I have a responsibility to caretake it. Oh, this project that I've poured my heart and soul into could add value in these numerous ways. And now I can fund it because I have more authority, but it's the responsibility piece is more online. So with the dawn of crypto, we've taken out the middleman, mm -hmm. increased authority. And now what we're going to see is the increase of responsibility, hopefully, as, as more people begin to kind of come out of that fog, right? Dude, you're, you're so in alignment with, with what I've been teaching um, because I've been saying that what's happening right now, at least what I'm becoming aware of, is all these public projects that are trying to launch at global levels, most of them are being encoded by developers that haven't worked on their relationship to money. <laughs> they haven't tried to look at you know how they view themselves in this hierarchy or what is happening with those old systems and what parts of it are bad or good. Uh, and they're just encoding the next, the, the next, uh, projects on the blockchain with the same traditional concepts. And mm -hmm. it's like, what's going on? So my question is like, wh what have you, have you ever heard of the term toxic capitalism? Uh, to a degree, but let me, what's your definition on that? I'm curious. So my definition on toxic capitalism, cause I love capitalism. I love capitalism. I think, I think it's necessary. Like you said, like it's, it's a way for us to generate or to create and then have something that gives value or, you know, to give a monetary value. So, you know, like, oh, that was a really good creation. Um, but because of manipulation, because of years of, of, of indoctrination, let's say, and infiltration, there has been uh, a, um, a, a, a divisive way of doing capitalism, a way that facilitates control and, you know, leaving the few to win. So my perspective of it, of toxic capitalism is um, the type of capitalism that you go into where, okay, I got to come in here and I'm, I'm going to win. I got to take, somebody needs to lose for me to win mm -hmm. or, or um, sort of like, um, what's another way? Uh, oh, uh, the, the, the flow of like, if I have a lot of money, if you come into the space and I, and you have a lot of money, you can make a lot of money. If you don't have a lot of money, you don't make a lot of money. Right. So money makes money. So there's all these little concepts that are built into our, our reality, really the ones that we, that we normalize that gets justified with like, Oh, that's just business. That's just business. I'm not mm -hmm. here. I'm not, it's not nothing personal. It's just business. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> and what, what do you perceive toxic capitalism to be? For sure. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Um, one example that kind of comes to mind for me is toxic capitalism is when you take the hierarchy and restrict the whole field. So let's go back to our pack of horses, right? It's like we have the natural hierarchy of the horses that they have, right? And in humans, it's, it's like naturally competitive. Like humans are going to compete with each other. It's like, especially men. And, and this competition is what drives evolution forward. But what happens if you now restrict that entire pack of horses to like a little pen, right? And so <clears throat> what's kind of happened is, is big money, big business, big government has created this wall around the high, around the pack, right? So you have nature functioning within limitations mm -hmm. that are not natural. And so yes, there's going to be like different nuances where people are like, oh, it's just business. And you know, they screwed, you know, they screwed you over on this or that. Um, but if we like zoom out to almost a bigger picture, the big problem, and this is kind of a crypto assault to a degree um, at this point is removing that pen so that the mm -hmm. natural hierarchy can now run, right? So that pack of horses is about to take off across the Great Plains. And that's what we've seen with, with the rise of cryptos, this pack of horses is running and all of these different uh, tokens or technologies are now competing with each other. And that's entirely natural. But what's not natural is when they're closed in and turned into CBDCs and, you know, like- It's like, it's like I love that analogy because it's like all the ranchers 
of all the different farms are like, oh, no, how do we <laughs> gotta control these horses? And it's like, sorry, it's over. <laughs> We're going to create a bunch of uh, uh, or you're just going to run wild, I guess, at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is this is um, I, it reminds me of a meme I saw recently that it was two it was two pictures. Uh, the one on top was a leaf. It was a uh, it was a. Um, uh, pine pine needles pine 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 needles you know the the ones from pine tree and so mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just a little branch and it shows all the pine needles and and the structure of it and it says um it says order and then below it there's another image and it's then it's all the pine needles removed placed in 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 order by size the 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 branches removed placed in order by size and then it says chaos and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's exactly what you just described. It's like you you create a pen, you create a, a a little area, and you call it natural, and then you throw people in there, and they're trying their best, <laughs> but but it's like you're stuck in the pen, you're stuck in the system, and how it functions. That's, yeah, Syn synthetic order versus natural order. That's like the key difference, right? So like healthy capitalism would be if you just let everything run free yeah right so it's not about like necessarily the elements of competition being out of line it's actually about the field of potential being restricted Oof. that's the key finish finish your thought because you just blew my mind i'm i say i i make noises when i my, mind, my mind gets blown <laughs> that's literally what sovereignty is right so with the field of potential being unlimited then there's so many different things that can be experienced across the board. And that's when we, we experience a society that's like, and get into some other stuff, but like, we're going to, we're going to see free energy. We're going to see cryptocurrency, you know, cryptocurrencies. We're going to see all of these nuanced technologies like med beds coming in. We're going to see all of these different things that are like, quote unquote, conspiracy theories or fabled on, on threads or forums. But the technology has been around for decades, if not centuries. And we're going to see the transition of that, right, as the field of potential is opened. And the number one mechanism for control is, is money at this point. So that's why there's been such a huge battle with crypto, is if they lose this battle, the field of potential will be open. And then if... If we hit that next mark, which is actually like free energy potentials, or we get back into like safe nuclear technologies and out of these environmentally destructive, like lithium mining and like, even mm -hmm. like the production of solar panels is incredibly high and like wind generators, like kill tons of birds, like the technologies they're relying on can be controlled, the alternative technologies. But when we look at like free energy or like water powered cars, like water powered cars have been around since the 1930s, like salt water. It's we insane. Can... I've actually, it's like you can do, uh, it's like a gallon of water gets you like a thousand miles or something. It's insane. Yep. And all you need is, is an electrolyte and it's super simple science. All we're doing is, um, fracturing the, bo the um, bonds between hydrogen and oxygen and then burning the hydrogen. And some people have played around with these techs and have actually like made their engines last way longer. Um, I've, I've actually seen one in real life and saw the guy turning it on in front of me. He opened up the bucket and he mm -hmm. had the, no, the the two nodes in the in the bucket, turns it mm -hmm. on, and then it just start, it just starts to bubble this weird yeah. bubble. Yeah. And, and then and then he's like, okay, yeah, now it's on. And then he turns it off. He's like, all right, now it's just water again. Yeah. And it's like, wait, what's the byproduct? There, there is no byproduct. <laughs> There's no byproduct. And that's, that's where we're headed is yeah. literally, right? We can look at what happened over the last two years. Mm -hmm. That's why I said it was like, this is the, the stranglehold that, that was the darkness was attempting to put on the light. Because now we are now at the brink of knowing that these things are real. So let's put fear into everybody and make them forget that those things were even real. And where we're at now is, oh, shoot, that stranglehold wasn't be able to be completely held on the full mass of people on the planet. So now we're going to see the release of these, these technologies, like even the water power car, it's, it's still hit mainstream. It's just only a, only like a supercar, like a Volkswagen supercar. Yeah, you can yeah. like find, find like it's run by salt water 100%, but it's like a half a million dollar car, you know, yeah. and so that's. That's what we're going to see now. The field of potential is opening, and that's why I'm optimistic. Like I'm, 
there's no doom and gloom with me because I'm only seeing the unlimited field of potential. And a lot of people don't realize that there's a hole in the fence. There's a hole in the pen that's been put up and they're arguing about, oh, I don't like the way people do business in this pen. I don't like the way things happen in this pen. Oh, I don't like the way, like I have to do this or that in this pen. And it's like, there's a freaking hole over there. You can leave the pen. <laughs> Just <anytime> leave. <laughs> but guess what? The people that are in the pen with you may not leave with you. And that's why a lot of people are afraid to leave is mm. if they leave, they have to find others. They have to make new connections. They have to open their heart more because they can't necessarily, they're not the people that they loved, that they grew up with won't necessarily follow them out of that hole. And people can go back and forth too and begin to like do stuff outside of the pen, come right back in and be like, Hey, this is all the things that are possible. And you can create stuff out there and bring it back into that market and sell it in that, in that pen market, you know, that closed market and begin to blow it up. And slowly people are going to realize, and, and that's where the world is at right now. And there's so much, so many people ideally should be optimistic. I don't like to use the word should, but I'm going to say it. A lot of people should be optimistic because we are living in one of the greatest times and things are going to get fun. But if you are unwilling to do the work, it will, it will seem mm. like you're drowning. It mm. will seem like you're starving, but that's because there's a new source of water there's a new source of life and it's coming from within each of us but we have to remove the sediment we have to remove all of the toxicity within ourselves for us to really tap into it and so a lot of people you know in our conscious community i put quotes on it because um i believe a lot of people think that they're conscious but lack the capacity to critically think and so when this movement originally started like 10 years ago, and it was long before that too, it, it already started. But when it like really was in its renaissance, like 10 years ago, it was like, it was weird to be a part of it, but everybody knew like this was the beginning of something special. And one unique thing was that everybody could critically think and share ideas. And now the matrix has kind of creeped in and began to um, confuse those because we have more mainstream people who, who aren't able to critically think, thinking like, oh, being woke and, and, and like doing societal things like, oh, everybody can be any gender they want or anybody can be this or that. Anybody can identify as a phone or a camera or anybody can do anything. Tolerance is also a poison mm -hmm. because it, it doesn't push anything forward. It, it, the moment like you say that tolerance is like, the pinnacle is the moment that you begin, you become prejudice against intolerance. So you become closed off to debate and debate is where critical thought happens. So that's the new pen is like dividing. It's like, com it's like complacency and stagnation on a, on a spiritual level. <laughs> mm -hmm. And those are the people that want to stay in the pen. And, and yeah. I don't feel anything other than like one day those people will decide to, to grow. And and if those are people I love, then I'll be there. I'll pick up the phone and I'll answer. But I also have to respect their timing and use my time in a way that creates a better environment so that when they leave the pen, there's a new city, there's a new way of being, there's a new culture for them to immediately tap into. And we're able to kind of go through a crash course in critical thinking. We're able to have healthy debate and challenge each other because that's what's going to push the pack forward. And, and that's the time we're living in. And, it, and it's absolutely beautiful. Bridging the gap, right? Mm -hmm. Bridging the gap for those that eventually, because I, I always say that too, that awareness is inevitable. And so that's why I'm focused so much on building and creating this new reality because I'm like, well, eventually they'll, they'll see it. You know, eventually it'll, mm -hmm. it'll, it'll they'll become so, um, uh, they'll be putting so much pressure and fear that it, it's, it's going to be this like, Oh yeah, I got to look at this now and, and move this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, this was uh this was a great interview. A great, great, great um, conversation. I have a couple more questions left and then we can end it. So what are some daily self care and grounding practices that you do to help during triggering moments, especially nowadays? For me personally, like the most important thing is that I'm doing things to stay in my body. 
Mm. So yes, I do meditation. Yes, I do these things, but the most consistent thing is actually working out, like moving my body, being active, right? Because how can I shape reality if I'm not in shape? Right. If I, if my body isn't capable of actually moving things and doing things, then how can I expect to change a world that's right outside my window? And then I guess the next most important thing is really staying on my health, really staying disciplined on that. And so I know everybody has different diets and I have like a unique diet, so I'm not going to sit here and prescribe specific diets. But what I will say is it's really important for people to do periods of detoxing detoxing the kidneys, detoxing the livers, the liver, detoxing heavy metals. You know, like these are really important things to slow down aging and to, to increase our sensitivity to reality, which is going to inform us of how to, to shape the world, right? And so the spiritual is physical. And that's like the full loop. People are like, you're not just your body. You're not just your mind. You're not your emotions, your spirit, but then spirit is all of the things as well. And so for me, it's more, it's been way more of a physical focus. And that's the most important place to start because your nervous system is going to gain some stability. And then you're going to clear that brain fog. And then you're going to now naturally develop the capacity to adapt through critical, through critical thinking. And so those are like the, the key components. And everybody can bring in different flavors. You can go to, you can go to classes to work out. You can go to the gym by yourself. You can get all the equipment you need and do it in your house. Um, that's the most important thing, though. That that I'd say for sure. Love it. Yeah, movement, movement, movement. If you're not moving, you're stagnating. If you're stagnating, you're coagulating. <laughs> you want to move your body exactly. Um, and then the last question here, Kai, before we end it, thank you so much. You have just been an amazing interviewee and I appreciate your energy and your time. So thank you. You have a few minutes to speak to millions of people. What do you leave them with? Remember who you are. Remember what you came here for. Let go of everything that is holding you back. And even when it seems helpless or hopeless, just focus on the next step. It's extremely simple. Keep it simple. It's always been simple. It will always be simple. God made everything in existence, creator, whatever you want to call it, made everything in existence. And that everything has an order. And that order is extremely simple. And you can see it all around you. You can feel it all around you. And it is inside of you. It has always been inside of you. And it will always be inside of you and outside of you at the same time. Don't let the darkness cloud the clarity that is within your heart and your soul. Love it. Love it. Thank you. Thank you, Kai. Thank you, brother. Seriously, um, your perspective is unique in and of itself, but your journey and your story is powerful and unique too. So thank you for sharing it. Thank you for being here. Thank you all for watching. Make sure you follow Kai on Instagram. It's Kai, it's a pineal, P-I-N-E-A-L underscore uh, clarity, right? C-L-A-R-I-T-Y. It's purity. Pure, oh, pure, <laughs> pineal, that's on me. Pineal, I thought I saw it. I, I saw the wrong one. Pineal underscore purity, P-U-R-I-T-Y. Follow Kai. He, he writes the most amazing poems and just these little short content form writing that you do that's just like it's like it's like a punch in the spiritual face every time <laughs> i'm like oh my god thank you kai i love you <laughs> uh awesome thank you thank you always remember gamify your abundance and we'll see you guys next time